a mainstream comedy with a budget of $92 million that is so outrageously edgy that it risks offending multiple communities and winds up with protesters picketing its gala premiere. With more than one actor doing things that could get them canceled, it's doubtful that you could make a movie like this today. But somehow in 2008, the cast and crew of Tropic Thunder persevered and created a modern comedy classic. But it wasn't without difficulty. I am New York City zero budget guerrilla filmmaker, Sean Weathers. And I am Canadian screenwriter and playwright, Angus Combe. And for the next two hours, we're going to be guiding you through the controversies, the challenges, and the triumphs that went into making the 2008 hit action comedy, Tropic Thunder. The No Rules Film School is now in session. Man, talk about coming in hot. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know. I, I think that's kind of a brilliant way to start, you know, like you're kind of meeting the characters without knowing you're meeting the characters. And uh, I can imagine, I think, I think when I first saw it, I didn't even realize that this was part of the movie when it first started. This is what um, Rodriguez and Tarantino wish they could have done with Grindhouse. This yeah. is what Grindhouse should have been. Like the, the way <laughs> this movie comes in hot is like with the fake trailers and the fake movies and everything that Grindhouse was trying to do, this movie executes it so much better right off the bat. Yeah. Oh yeah. And it doesn't feel like exposition. You don't know that you're really learning stuff that you need to know. So it's just, uh, it's perfect. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> this is crazy. <laughs> oh man. This is obviously uh, making fun of Eddie Murphy's remake of The Nerdy Professor. Yeah. I think somebody <laughs> said that in a way his character is like Chris Farley doing Eddie Murphy. Do you think that's accurate? I'm not sure. That's a lot of <laughs> degrees to go down. <laughs> That is hilarious. I forgot how funny that was. Those are yeah. three really hot trailers to come in with. Oh, yeah. Oh, there's more. There's more. There's more. Oh, yes. <laughs> wow. And this is RDJ. This is the reason we're watching this. Indeed, it is. Iron Man and Spider Man. Oh, yes. This kind of feels like the name of the rose to me. The name of the rose? Yeah, that old movie with uh, Sean Connery was based on an old novel. But uh, Listen, if you're going to reference a movie even I don't know, <laughs> I doubt anyone else listening is going to know it. Well, if you lose me, you can forget about keeping the audience with your references. <laughs> Well, that's the interesting thing about this movie, though. I feel like in some ways it is making reference to a lot of older movies, a lot of 80s movies. And uh, I guess well, movies still... people have heard of, though. <laughs> oh, well, yes. Well, I think that that was a big hit. But yes, you're right, though. And Ben Stiller, I think I guess he came up with the idea for Tropic Thunder back in 1987. So way oh, back wow. then. That is a was, long while ago. Yeah, he was uh, acting in a movie called Empire of the Sun. I'm almost disappointed leave. the movie's going to start now. I wanted oh, more yeah. fake trailers <laughs> and fake that's music right. videos. <laughs> more yeah, booty well, juice. <laughs> that's the thing. That's the thing. You know, how are they going to top that? They start so, so hot. It's like, that's never going to be topped now. Yeah. But we'll see. We'll see, though. But, um, yeah, so I guess... Ben Stiller first conceived of this back in the 80s, so it makes sense that he was thinking of some of the 80s. 80s movies? Blockbusters, yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. The booty juice one was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. I forgot how funny that was. Yes. Ah. Uh. 
So Ben Stiller kind of did everything in this. He wrote, direct, produced, starred. He he did. He did indeed. Like I do that, but I'm doing that with no <laughs> no consequences. It's like the money out of my pocket. This is with like a big budget. Yes. So there's a lot to lose. Absolutely. $92 million. And it seems like a pretty edgy project to uh, risk that money on. Yeah. The one thing, though, he does have a lot of show bu showbiz buddies because this movie is littered with stars. Some stars that were kind of on harder times, like RDJ, um, you know, he had his drug yes. issues and he's had comebacks and failed comebacks. But this year was big for him. So he was, was able to get him on the cheap. Which yeah. a year a year after this, forget it. I mean, his salary <laughs> would have been the whole budget. Yeah, and of course you had Tom Cruise with a cameo. Tom Cruise is one of the biggest stars. He's like with Cary Grant, one of the biggest movie stars ever of all time. But he yes. had his hard times because he had that jumping on the couch Oprah stuff. I'm not sure when that whole glib conversation with him and Matt Roker. It's Matt Roker, no Matt. Lauer, Matt Lauer. Matt Lauer. With him yeah. and Matt Lauer when he called him glib. And they had that big back and forth with um with that situation. And then also the Scientology stuff. So he had a lot of controversies. Um, I definitely know the Oprah thing was still a big cloud over his career at this point. So this really helped him a lot. So yeah, he had a lot of a lot of pretty big, big bangers in here doing bit parts. Oh yeah. Yeah. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Speaking of Tarantino. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. This whole opening sequence is just so over the top. It's so huge. Again, <laughs> you know, you, you think they can't possibly top the trailers leading into the movie, but then you get this. And, uh, oh, and now it's like, how are they going to top this? This is like... This is insane. This is kind of like the ending to um, Jacob's Ladder. <laughs> yeah. But obviously, like, the whole... I guess what they're really spoofing here is maybe, like, Platoon and um, Apocalypse Now, those Vietnam movies, um, Full Metal Jacket, stuff like that, I think, is what they're probably focused on here. Yeah. Um, well, apparently, Stiller actually wanted to make a film that was kind of based on actors that he knew who had been in some of those 80s war movies like platoon and hamburger hill and they would talk about the intense boot camp training and the war simulations that made them feel like they were real soldiers now and stiller just found this hilarious because he thought you know he was pretty sure that being an actor in a war film is nothing like being a real soldier in a real war. So that was kind of these the, were his the, friends he was talking about. His friends, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so that you know that was kind of a an idea for a satire, I suppose, of mocking actors. his friends. Uh, yeah, but he uh, he's brought on a couple oh, of other geez. writers. <laughs> Just... <laughs> What was that series of films that uh, Chuck Norris did? Was it Missing in Action? M missing in Action, yes. Weren't there like a Definitely. lot of scenes like that in Missing in Action, <laughs> those type of movies, where the plane's about to take off and then someone's running towards it? Yes, yeah, that's a very familiar trope. And Huge I trope. Think there's, I think there's a scene uh, of him rising up out of the water, which is definitely a... He got hit with like action. 30 bullets. And he's like, <laughs> <Yeah>. survive. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Um, I'm sorry, what were you saying? So when, when he brought in some other writers, uh, Justin Thoreau and Ethan Cohen, and they, uh, they kind of transformed the script into uh, more of a spoof of Vietnam War movies. So his idea this, wasn't originally going to be a. It wasn't actually going to be a comedy. Oh, well, it was going to be a comedy. It was going to be a satire, but it was going to be more focused on the actors and their attitudes, 
And uh, in fact, I think it was originally going to be. Oh, about so they... it, w- it went from satire to um, parody then. Parody or spoof. Yeah. Okay. Um, so. So, yeah, it was going to be about the actors going to boot camp and training and then returning with post-traumatic stress disorder, which actually sounds like a kind of a unique little movie. You know, that could have been interesting, but they turned it into more of a, well, a spectacle, I guess, with all these very, very specific parodies of specific war movies and action movies. But also, you know, just the general kind of spoof of the genre itself you know the whole war movie genre with a particular focus on the vietnam war movie genre so in stiller's original draft it was going to be serious at the end when they're dealing with the ptsd uh i don't think it was going to be serious i think it was Uh meant to you know satire these (laughs) satirize these actors oh so their ptsd would be like kind of all in their heads because they're idiots yeah yeah, okay. I mean, I don't, I don't know what it exactly happened, but it was just the idea that he thought these guys were being silly, you know, thinking that they were real soldiers because they'd gone to some training. Yeah, yeah, that makes more sense. Yeah. So yeah. Stiller was more so making fun of the actors, and now it's more so making yes. fun of the movies with the script change. Yeah, although I think uh, there are two things <clears throat> going on, though. I think we have the two sides of it. We have the you know, the parody of the action. <laughs> are those supposed to be his hands? <laughs> yes, I think they are. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> oh, he looks like an octopus. <laughs> yes. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, he's doing the spoofs and the parodies of the war movies and the, you know, the genre in general. But he's also, at the same time, doing a satire of Hollywood and the people who work there the actors, the agents, the executives. So it kind of has the two different streams in a way, um, mm. the satire and the parody. And, you know, I, I tend to use those terms interchangeably, but actually satire is meant to mean that it utilizes humor to comment or criticize an aspect of people or society. Okay, so professor. It would be, it would be satire... <laughs> of the real people in Hollywood, but parody is more using humor to imitate a specific work. So when we see something that looks like missing in action or it looks like Rambo, you know, that's a parody of that. And if we're talking spoof, then that means kind of the whole genre. We're spoofing the whole genre of war movies. So mm-hmm. those are kind of the, the differences in those terms. So. And I guess now here is where we get into more of the satire because uh, we now know that we're actually making a movie. Mm. Yeah, I think they're interchangeable because the meaning changes for everyone. I don't think people necessarily like look in the dictionary when they they think of what's a spoof (laughs) or what's a satire. I think most people go by feel, you know? Yeah, yeah. I think that's why, like, if they did, then it wouldn't be as interchangeable. Yeah. No, I think, uh, you know, I do the same thing. I use them all all the time to mean different things. I tend to use satire if it's kind of sharp and kind of going deep into something. Mm -hmm. And parody if it's just kind of over the top, silly, fun. But that's not strictly the... And and just like how... I don't even use it that way either. So even between the two of us, we use it different. I more so view satires, you have something to say. Yes. And, you know, there's a bigger message behind it. And I move like spoo for parodies. It's just like, oh, look at us making fun of how stupid these things are. Aren't these things stupid? You know, with like no real message behind it, you know? Yeah. And I, I would agree with that. That's kind of how I look at it, too. Um, but it's interesting to note that satire is meant to be not only making a point, but a point about something real, like real people or society. So anyway, that's the extreme reality of the terms. Yeah. So yes, now we realize, uh, it's, it's a movie within a movie at this point now. (laughs) It is. Yeah. And um, 
there's certainly a lot of movies that do that, you know, where you, you kind of start off thinking you're watching the movie and then a director says cut and suddenly you realize, oh, you were watching them filming a movie, not, not actually the movie itself. It used to kind of bother me with how unrealistic some of those scenes were because they've a got lot the of, a lot effects. of funny people. A lot of funny people in this movie so far. Yes. Danny McBride, I think Absolutely. that guy is. He's hilarious. Obviously, our major stars. And a lot of people have gone on to bigger careers since this, you know? Oh, yes. Bill Hader. I mean, he, he became huge after this. He had his own TV show on uh, HBO. Oh, yes. I think he wrote on South Park for a while. I think he was part of Saturday Night Live a little bit, maybe. Um, yeah, yeah but he's, he's hilarious, too. Yeah, this is so 80s. Over-the-top, <laughs> unnecessary explosions. Yes. Usually they'd have, like, uh, fake news shows within this, but Access yes. Hollywood, I think, is an actual real, and in Variety, obviously, is a real magazine. It is, yeah. One of the ways you can tell that this is a big budget movie, not a low budget independent movie. Yeah, I could see a, I could see a, a, a Chris Farley vibe to to this right here. Yeah. The blonde here. Yes. The funny fat guy. The drug problem. Yeah, it's. Yeah. yeah, I could definitely see Farley. Yeah. And here's the controversy with the blackface. Here, here is yeah one of the key controversies of the film. And um, when talking about you know parody and whatnot, that was one thing that puzzled me is what what exactly is that a parody of? Because I was trying to connect it to other movies. And I couldn't think of another movie where a white actor did that. You know, I, I mean, talking about 80s action movies here. Um, but I guess this is where we go back to the satire of Hollywood. There was that not... one movie, that one comedy, where the guy wanted to, he was dating the black girl. But he was worried the parents wouldn't like him, so he put blackface on. Uh huh. Yes. Do you remember which one of that movie I'm talking about? <laughs> what was that? Soul Man. Soul Man. Yeah, I think that Soul was Man. The, Soul yeah. Man. Yeah. So yeah, you're right. There is that. <laughs> but, but I again, doubt this though. is spoofing Soul Man. <laughs> no. But yeah, talk about a movie that couldn't be made now, Soul Man. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I think this is a little different because it's about an actor who's doing this within the movie, within the movie. And I think that's where we get to the satire, that it's meant to be not a spoof of a movie so, per se, but it's meant to be a satire of certain types of actors in Hollywood who think that they can do whatever they want and who are, you know, method actors and really get into the part. So I think it's meant to target a type of actor as opposed to a specific movie well, who would genre. that actor even be because usually method actors that go really far for a part i wouldn't necessarily make fun of would you make fun of a daniel day lewis <laughs> i mean he wouldn't do something like this but he's like this an actor that just goes way like into parts you know or yes. uh, joaquin phoenix those are those are the actors i think of when i think like man they're going like really deep into this or like christian bale when he lost all that weight for the mechanic or machinist yes. or that movie. Yes. Where he's like real thin. Yeah. Well, Robert Downey Jr., of course, is very much that kind of actor himself. And uh, so he's spoofing himself. <laughs> he, well, to, to, he did make that comment once that he, he was sort of spoofing himself. And I think specifically the fact that he never breaks character he stays in character at all times um i think that's something he does robert downey jr so they kind of wrote that in but
but Downey Jr. has also said that uh, he's actually modeling the character on three actors, Russell Crowe, which actually I thought of because of the Australian thing and the sort of blonde hair, Colin Farrell, and Daniel Day Lewis. So Daniel Day Lewis was one of the. Oh, Daniel guys Day Lewis! Yeah, he, he was thinking of. You see, yeah. I didn't know yeah. that. I, yeah, I, I, that's weird. So, yeah. There you go. So. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, well, why make fun of poor Daniel Day Lewis? He's such a great actor. Yeah. Well, this is where you get into that question too of, you know, it's one thing to parody movies that we might view as bad, you know, let's make fun of bad movies. But when you start making fun of apocalypse now and movies like that is that really a, something to make fun of or is that you know i don't right so, they're making fun of apocalypse now and daniel day lewis yeah <laughs> so that's not cool that's not cool. who knows who knows but um apparently in the original script downey's character was supposed to be irish but he asked them to change that because he had already worked with an australian accent in natural born killers and he felt he could more easily slip into that and kind of improvise so that's how he became australian mm. natural born killers one of the finalists for the the rbj yes. poll that we almost watched yes and i i like that movie i love it man. yeah tom cruise here we go yes now this this is something that um, was actually supposed to be a secret, and I don't think I had any idea that Tom Cruise was in this movie the first time I saw it. I think it was quite a shock. And uh, and I oh Jesus! <laughs> oh, he broke his nose. Oh man! <laughs> the kid's ass. Hater is so fun. Yeah. <laughs> right, here we go. Nick Nolte. Nick yes. Nolte playing himself. Yes. He came, he came in his own clothes. <laughs> One thing that um, Ben Stiller said was that this moment was originally thought of as a Jaws parody. Mm -hmm. We're going to reference Clearly. Robert Shaw's character in Jaws, mm -hmm. but he decided to pull back on that because he thought it was kind of overdone or something. It still feels that way, though. It does. I mean, the only thing yeah. he didn't do is scrape a chalkboard, but... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, so he pulled back a bit, but but Tom Cruise, he's amazing in this. And I'm pretty sure I did not recognize him until halfway through the movie or even later he's so unrecognizable as this character the nose gives him away oh yes yeah distinctive and that voice i mean i but i've seen so many tom cruise movies over the years because again yeah. he may not be like if you think the biggest movie star now you may think maybe leonardo DiCaprio or someone else but when you think about the fact that he was a huge movie star from like the mid early to mid eighties to now, that's a long yeah. time. That's a long, long time to be a leading it man. Is. It is. You look at some of his contemporaries, you're like, dude, is he drinking from the fountain of youth or something? <laughs> that's true. So we're watching the extended cut, right? This is the um, uncut version? Yes. Yes, it is. So this guy was a pretty funny comedian, but his career went nowhere. He was one of the people that was part of the fallout from the Cat Williams interview. We did oh, yes. do the um, podcast with where we spoke about Cat Williams and yes. um, Friday After Next. This guy was in Big Mama's House 2, I think. Oh, yeah. And I think that was the movie that Martin Lawrence wanted Cat Williams to be in with him. But then Cat uh -huh. Williams is like, dude, why are you wearing a dress? Like, you know? 
You yeah. did that in the first movie. The second movie, you could do what you want. Why are you still in the dress? And this guy, I think, took the Cat Williams role. Uh-huh. And then afterwards, after the Cat Williams movie uh, podcast dropped and got all like 50, 60 million views, this guy came on an interview and said like, yeah, it was a mistake. He wished he didn't do it. It ruined his career. And uh, he was hilarious in this, but you kind of wonder why you never saw him again after that. And he kind of implied yeah. a, like a lot of the stuff that Cat Williams was saying about the behind the scenes politics and sexual stuff was a lot of it was true. Uh-huh. But uh, yeah, he was hilarious in this, but I know he was in this and obviously um, Big Mama's House too, but uh, I'm not sure what else he was in. Obviously not a lot. Uh-huh. So it's hard to imagine, but apparently Stiller had originally planned to cast Keanu Reeves as Tug Speedman. And he was going to play Rick Peck, who's Tug's agent. Mm. Keanu Reeves, I don't get it, man. This is a parody? What's that? (laughs) (laughs) I I don't see it working with Keanu Reeves, man. I don't no. know if he's self-aware enough to like do something like this. He's not really a comedian. I know he's been in comedies like the Bill and Ted stuff, but I don't yeah. know. I feel like that's just him playing himself. I don't know yeah. if he can be part of like a self-aware comedy like this. I don't think that plays into his strengths. Yeah, that's a good point. I think the casting is perfect here. Everyone is hilarious. Oh, a yeah. bunch of really good comedians that, that all came together. Kind of similar yes. to Friday After Next. Obviously, Friday After the Next isn't the quality of movie as this is. This is a huge, big budget Hollywood movie. Friday After Next is just a quickie, low budget, you know, um, almost indie film in a way, financed mainly by Ice Cube. But there's a lot of funny comedians in that. And they all yeah. did really well in their parts. And the same thing with this. Like, even the minor parts are filled with like really funny comedians. Yeah. That's true. And the case of Nick Nolte, not a funny comedian, but a great actor who's batshit crazy playing (laughs) an actor that's batshit crazy. (laughs) Yes, he nails it. (laughs) Tom Cruise was initially supposed to play Rick Peck, the agent, but he suggested adding this character, the studio head character, and uh, so they kind of went with that and they developed the character together. Everybody was supposed to play that agent or something? <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wanted to play it? <laughs> well, I don't know. I guess, um, well, it gets worse than that, though. Because um, after Cruz vacated the role of Rick Peck, then uh, Owen Wilson was cast and was going to play the part. But mm. then apparently he, he, comm- he attempted to commit suicide. Oh, August of 2007. I, th- I think I heard about that. That was the time he yeah. was dating, um, what's her name? That blonde actress, uh, uh, gosh, Kurt Russell's daughter. Oh, yes. Uh, um, um Kate? Kurt Russell and Goldie Hawn's daughter. Yeah. Kate Hudson. K- Kate, Kate Hudson. Hudson. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I think he was dating Kate Hudson and she broke up with him and then he uh, sliced okay. his wrist or something. I think. Yeah, I'm not sure the details, but he mm. he attempted suicide in August 2007, and so uh, he dropped out, and uh, that's when Matthew McConaughey was brought in. Mm. So they went through three other people before they got to Matthew McConaughey. Mm-hmm. I like McConaughey in that role. Yeah, he's good. Because I think this is a good mix of like really funny comedians and like really good actors. Like Nick Nolte, Tom Cruise, Matthew McConaughey, more so actors, and these other guys as comedians. I think they contrast each other really well. And you have different perspectives, you know? There's a certain earnestness to Cruise and Nolte and um, McConaughey in that they're just really performing the material extremely well that contrasts well with these other actors are just trying to get as many laughs a minute as they can. So I think, yeah. I think the casting here works really well. 
And of course, the best the best mix of the acting and the comedy would be RDJ, which is the reason why we're watching this movie to begin with. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Of course, when uh, when Ben Stiller first approached Robert Downey Jr. about playing this part, he uh, apparently <laughs> said, this is the stupidest idea I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> Stiller said, "Yeah, I know. Isn't it great?" So, I actually um, there was a million extras for this movie. I wasn't going to watch them all, uh, so I just picked yes. I just picked the ones that intrigued me the most, and yeah. I stumbled on. So this movie has multiple commentaries. The first one was a snooze fest. It was your typical mm. commentary. Oh, this is how we made this. This is how we made that. This is what we were thinking yeah. when this happened. This is what we were thinking when that happened. And the only people that cares about that stuff are the people that filmed it. You know, it's not really entertaining to how everything yeah. was made. You know, you don't want to. Yeah. You don't want to know how the sausage is made. You just want to eat the sausage. Uh, yes. But the the second commentary that I'm lucky I decided to give a chance to, RDJ Robert Downey Jr. is just in character for the entire <laughs> the entire <laughs> the entire thing. And um, yes, and they say. I remember there was a line in this movie like, "When are you going to be a character?" He's like, "After direct commentary," you know. Yeah, <laughs> and, that's right. And he he stuck to his word. He did that's the commentary right. in character, and it was yeah. it was hilarious. It was just like him riffing for like the whole movie, and in yes. character, it was just, it was great. Yeah, and again, he's sort of satirizing himself with that. The fact that he never breaks character. No, he's not satirizing himself. He's satirizing <laughs> Daniel Day Lewis. Russell, Russell Crowe, and yeah, Daniel Day Lewis. Um, Poor Daniel Day Lewis. But Daniel Day Lewis did play an Indian once. So he did race yeah. band as well. Yes. Last of the Mohicans, I believe. Yes, that's right. Oh, shit. Who just died? I just missed that. Is that the director? Yeah, the, the director, yes. Stepped on a landmine, presumably. I love their reaction. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what did they think happened there? Like, you know, like... Yeah. Well, you think yeah. one of them would realize, <laughs> like, <laughs> wait a minute, he's really dead, you know? Yes. The movie does push the boundaries of believability in that way. Yeah, I mean, up until now, you could, you could, you could suspend your disbelief, but he literally just blew up in front of them, <laughs> you know? Exactly. Like they somehow think that was all planned and rigged and was fake so do you think that they, these were actually his friends that he was trying to spoof or did he just get into conversations with like maybe Sylvester Stallone or <laughs> Chuck Norris or some of these action stars it's just like they, he just found them like so fucking obnoxious and coked out at some party. And he's like, God damn, I hate these guys. Like, I just can't wait to spoof them. I mean, this is pretty like, <laughs> is this what you think of like how actors are? <laughs> you know, like he's, it's not showing a lot of respect, to, you know, if you think they're that yeah. stupid. Yeah, well, he, he described oh. them as, <laughs> yeah, see, we're, we're pushing the boundaries again. He's He's either really stupid or he's so determined to believe this oh, that God. he's yeah. <laughs> he's tasting it and he's saying it tastes like blood, but it's obviously fake, you know. Um, but um, I mean, I'm pretty sure faced with a real body that's been blown apart, it's going to be kind of obvious. Yeah, it's not a, not a problem. This is not the strongest part of the movie for me. No. 
It's a it's it's a little far fetched. It's too far fetched. Like far fetched to the point where it's funny is good. This is far fetched to the point it's stupid. Like no, when it's like no one's this stupid, it's like we're not laughing anymore. Yeah, yeah. this part of the movie is not really for me. Yeah, it's kind of what they needed to have happen so they could do the rest of the movie. They needed to sort of turn this corner, but I yeah, it's a rough turn, man. The car oh, almost flipped is. over on this turn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, totally, totally, yeah. Um, they maybe could have done it a little smoother than they did. Yeah. This part of the script could have used a few more uh, rewrites or run-throughs or whatever term you writers use. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I guess it's sort of, you know, they're, they're pushing the boundaries. They're going for extreme humor, you know, extreme gross-out humor. Or at least through extreme stupidity. Something. Extreme, extreme stupidity, but extreme, you know, he's tasting the blood on this severed head and the audience is all groaning and puking in the aisles because it's disgusting. Yeah. I think you could have still had the movie and be like, oh my God, this is real. You know, he just like freaks out, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think there's there's other ways they could have done it. Yeah, yeah. But um, but I guess he's really, you know, if you're going for the satire of certain types of actors, you know, this actor is so self-absorbed. Which makes me question, see. like, what actors did he see? <laughs> and what did he really think of them? You know? Yeah, well, he doesn't name them, you know, so... But he said he described them as friends, but who knows? Who knows? Yeah, supposedly Stallone in the 80s was someone that I think could be someone maybe he could be talking about. Yeah. Um, because I do know like what was that woman he married? Brigitte Nielsen. Uh, Brigitte Nielsen. I think yeah. they were saying on the set of um beverly hills cop 2 she was just having sex with everyone i oh. think while she was with stallone like she openly cheated on him oh, um, yeah. and then they were like i mean there was this painter who said he was just he'd sell him paintings and just like skyrocket the price for these like stupid paintings and uh -huh. he just kind of even mocked stallone for buying them and it kind of pissed off stallone I don't know his yeah. bodyguards try to set up to rob him as well. Not uh, ragging on Stallone, but I'm just saying, like, yeah. with those stories I've heard and trying to think of who we could think of, like, maybe Stallone could be one of maybe many actors he's spoofing in this one. Yeah. And he did do all those Rambo movies, too. Which, yeah. as much as this is a satire, isn't that far off from how they actually played out. <laughs> I think at one point, I don't know if this is still the case, Rambo 2 had the biggest body count in the history of cinema. Yes, I think And that's you're talking true. about like movies where there were wars, where armies were going against each other. This was an army of one man. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Look indeed. at the scene right now. Is this not Rambo? <laughs> like, yeah. Oh, totally. Yeah. <laughs> Rambo is definitely one of the movies there directly parroting or in fact all of the rambo movies up to this point even the recent ones where he's like a senior citizen yeah oh yeah i mean in a way the recent ones almost look more ridiculous than this because they're so over the top yeah so in a way Ben Stiller's whole life was kind of leading up to the making of this film. Um, I mentioned that he first came up with the idea in 1987. But uh, before that, when he was in high school, he uh, actually saw a TV show called SCTV, which is actually a Canadian sketch comedy show. Uh, it ran between of course, you had to go with the Canada route. Oh, yes. It ran between 1976 and 84, and uh, it actually aired on NBC in the U.S. from 81 to 83. And it's a show that a lot of people really love and uh, 
Conan O'Brien has cited it, for instance, and, and Ben Stiller was inspired by that show. And it made him want to do sketch comedy. And of course, SCTV specialized in satire and parody and uh, poking fun at movies and TV shows. So in a way, it's a direct line from there to here. And, and he started Okay, you out... win. Canada is great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks to Canada. Yeah. <laughs> you happy you can now? Thank, thank <laughs> we Canada move on? for the... <laughs> <laughs> Well, the first short film Stiller made was actually called The Hustler of Money. And it was a parody of the Martin Scorsese film, The Color of Money. And it got the attention of Saturday Night Live. And they actually aired it on Saturday Night Live. And then uh, he actually joined Saturday Night Live as a writer, but he only stayed for a few episodes because he really wanted to make more films and not what they were doing. So, but again, it's the path of doing parodies. I love that sapphire. fist thing and the fingers in the end. <laughs> yes. This just reminds me of Predator. It's <laughs> almost a scene directly from Predator. Yeah. Where Arnold does all that stuff too. Yeah. I love that uh, you were while you were talking, there was that funny scene with the um heroin. <laughs> He's like oh, yes. I think he said jelly beans. He's like, I love jelly beans. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> but um on the commentary I heard with um RDJ, uh he was also on there too. Um what's his name? Jack Black. And oh, yes. um, yeah, he was saying he had no idea how to do a, a character addicted to drugs. And he was like looking for videos or anything he could find. And he just, he just kind of winged it. He didn't really know what he was doing. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. It's still funny either way, but. <laughs> totally. But you talk about, I just bring that because you talk about like RDJ spoofing someone who tries too hard. And Jack Black was like, yeah, I tried to Google some videos. I couldn't find anything. So I just showed up and did my thing. <laughs> you know, it's like the exact opposite of like the character that RDJ is spoofing, you know, Daniel Day-Lewis. Yes. Now, the, the, I have heard stories about um, shorter actors. I'm a short actor myself. I'm only 5'7". Um, yes. And uh, sometimes other people are taller than you. Sometimes it's the females and different things like that. So I have yes. heard stories about Ben Stiller digging ditches for co-worker, for, you know, co-stars to walk in so that he'd seem a little bit taller. And... Um, him and the RDJ were going back and forth on the commentary with this particular scene. And he's like, hey, why are you taller than me in this scene? Like, <laughs> you're shorter than me in real life. What's going on? And I don't know if Ben Stiller was joking or if those stories were just myths. But yeah. Ben Stiller was saying, hey, I heard stories about actors doing stuff like this. He's like, I should be, I should do that. You know, stuff like that he was saying. Yeah. And he was claiming like this just happened to be an accident that he was standing like, you know, obviously they're not on like a paved sidewalk or anything. So it's yeah. uneven ground. And he, he said, he's just so happy to be standing on a surface that made him look taller, which yeah. I mean, if you look at the wide shot, that does look like it's kind of true. You know, it yeah. doesn't look like they're doing it on purpose to even out the height. But uh, yeah. I just found it interesting that he's saying he heard stories about people doing that. And then the stories are about him doing that, you know? So it's just kind of, <laughs> it's kind of funny, you know? Actors, yeah. they have egos because here he is making fun of other actors for certain things. And then people make fun of him for certain things and he's pretending yeah. he's not doing it, you know? So, yeah. you know, even within the satire, they have their pride, you know? Oh yeah, <laughs> so. yeah, yeah, for sure. Because if he had no pride, he probably would make fun of his own height in this movie, oh, being yeah. a short action hero. Yeah. Yeah, why not? Could have been a lot of fodder in that. Yeah. I've never actually heard that about Ben Stiller, but I certainly have heard that about 
you know, more golden age Hollywood actors, but they would do that, dig a ditch or, or you maybe stand on a box or something to look taller. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder how tall he is because RDJ is not that tall. And they say RDJ uses lifts and he uses them in Iron Man because obviously oh, yes. Iron Man is supposed to be this like tall hero, which makes sense because there are some scenes in, in the Avengers movies where he looks as tall as some actors that are clearly way taller than he is. Um, so if Stiller is significantly shorter than Robert Downey Jr., I wonder how tall Stiller actually is. Yeah, that's a good question. Tom Cruise is another person with the height thing, too. Yeah. Like I said, I'm not going to leave myself out of it. I'm like, if you see my movies, I, I don't hide my height thing, but I'm, no. I'm short as well. So, how tall are you? Uh, five, nine, thereabouts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. You're five, six. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I did all that just to set up that joke. Yes. Well, yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> and I feel like I might already be shrinking, you know, sitting at a desk all day, bad posture. That spine compression as you get older. Yeah. Need to do more stretching or something to try and not be so tight and hunched over. So we got a little bit of a, a, a scene there where they were talking about his character, Simple Jack, in another movie. And that's one of the other controversies in this film was uh, the portrayal of Simple Jack, who I guess, uh, again, they're trying to make fun of Hollywood actors who play these kind of roles, sort of mentally disabled characters, to try Didn't to Rosie wars. O'Donnell play one? Oh. I think I remember Howard Stern making fun of her. Maybe she I'm played a mentally sure. ill person. Yeah. Maybe. And I think um didn't uh yeah, she was like and she played it really poorly too. I think that was the thing about the Rosie one. Okay. And I think um Sean Penn did one too. Sean Penn did. I yeah. am Sam, yeah. And I think they make direct reference to him in here. And he actually makes a cameo in here somewhere, I think. Um, but, um, but yeah, that character, Simple Jack, got them into some trouble. Uh, as part of the promotion for the movie, they created these uh, faux websites. Uh, one of them was for that booty sweat drink. Oh, and, yeah, that's uh, one hilarious. One the Rosie thing is called riding a bus with my sister. Oh, if okay. anyone wants to Google that, it is just so effing terrible oh. where she plays mentally. I guess Down syndrome is what most, uh, I, I think when people visualize mentally, you know, we don't want to say, do we want to say the R word? Will that get flagged <laughs> on YouTube? <laughs> I, I'm not sure, but they say it a lot in this movie. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll let them say it. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Down syndrome, I guess, is the main uh, illness that, you know, yeah. what you think of the R word to be. And yes. um, yeah, she was just terrible in that. I only heard clips of it from like Howard Stern spoofing her. But Riding the Bus with My Sister is a movie. And I think Sam I Am was okay. the other one that you were talking about. Yes. And, uh, and they even mentioned movies like Rain Man with Dustin Hoffman. I think Rayman was one of the ones that were done well, though. It was, yeah, it was. Because Dustin Hoffman is such a good actor, and the movie yeah. didn't really pander as much as some of these others' movie pander. Um, yeah, but yeah. no, it's a good movie, and I think, I think part of what they're saying is, you know, if you're going to do it, you have to do it kind of more like that, and don't do what you did with Simple Jack. <laughs> you know, they're sort of accusing him of not doing it right, and. Um, but, you know, they made a faux website to help promote the movie, sort of pretending that this was a real movie, Simple Jack. And people got so offended, you know, that they had to remove it. 
DreamWorks, um, they had to admit that, yeah, okay, maybe, maybe out of context, it could be taken the wrong way. <laughs> he doesn't even know the guy's name. <laughs> <laughs> that guy's actually Jay Baruchel, who's a Canadian actor. Of course he is. He's uh, he's done very, very well. Like, so well, I al almost wonder why he's done that well. But he's, he's good. He's talented. But he, uh, you know, a lot of Canadian actors don't achieve what he's achieved. He started out as a child on TV, and he just kind of got into big movies. And uh, I think he's friends. Uh, is with... he eating a bat? <laughs> yes, he is. Is yes, that like poisonous? Is. Isn't that what <laughs> caused like you know? Um, isn't a lot of these like viruses we have caused by like people eating like animals they shouldn't be? Um, I think that can be, you know, that can be one of the things. Isn't isn't COVID linked back to like bats? Um, something like that. I'm not sure. Because COVID's details. been around for a while. Like certain strands of COVID have been around before the main COVID yes. thing hit. But I know a lot yes. of these diseases are from people eating animals like they shouldn't be eating. And yeah. then just starting to spread those diseases around. Yeah. Yeah, because you try to eat a bat. <laughs> of course, the singer Ozzy Osbourne. Research famously. evidence suggests that SARS and MERS originated in bats. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a link to, there's a link there. Yeah. But totally. I don't want to get too sidetracked, but yeah. No. That's fucking gross. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Do you people? Yeah. <laughs> what do you mean, you people? <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of Rambo, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Played it to his ego. <laughs> One thing about RDJ with this black impression. He doesn't necessarily use any words that are offensive. No. Like, I, I think a lot of times, like, um, when people do, like, a white person does a black impression or someone of another race does a black impression, they kind of use certain words that can be really offensive. Mm -hmm. He's just trying to sound black. Not saying that that gives him a pass or anyone who's offended shouldn't be offended. But I think the fact that he doesn't go the cheap route, you yeah. know, is one of the reasons why it kind of works. Yeah. Well, I think one of the other things that people have cited as helpful is the fact that you, we have this other character here, Al Pacino, <laughs> Al Pacino, the rapper who uh, is actually black and is kind of outraged at him playing this character and keeps calling him on it. And that somehow helps a bit. What do you yeah. think about that? I know you're not, I know you're not into Howard Stern, but um, he has a co-host named Robin Quivers and oh, yes. he would say the most racist things. He wore black face <laughs> he did so much racist things, but the reason he got a pass is his co-host was a black woman and oh, she yeah. would just laugh hysterically at everything he said and did. 
and she got a lot of blacklash blacklash <laughs> she got a lot of blacklash <laughs> she got a lot of blacklash she got a lot of backlash for that because yeah you know it gave him a pass to do everything he wanted because there was someone black there on laughing at the jokes or being in yes. on the jokes so um not saying they casted the one black actor in the movie strategically but it's not a great look that you just have the one black actor there specifically so you won't get backlash, you know? Right. Like if yeah. it was a little bit more genuine, maybe you'd have a couple more black actors, but the yeah. one black actor you're there is to call the other guy and check. It's like he's there just for that almost, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah, that's a good point. And again, I'm not offended, but, you know, I'm just no. No. looking at it objectively. Yeah. Well, the amazing thing is that you kind of expected this to be the biggest controversy and you expected it to cause problems, but it didn't cause as many problems as the uh, the uh, Simple Jack character did. That got them into a lot more trouble. So let's get into some of the RDJ stuff. Yes. RDJ um he's had an up and down career he has um so us watching this originally was because we wanted to watch an rdj film and i put up some polls because i didn't i wasn't sure which one to pick and i never really thought of him as being like a guy that was in any one particular great movie i didn't think of robert downey jr saying man this one movie is just like one of the best movies i've ever seen and I still don't feel that way, but he's been in a lot of really, really, really good movies over the years. Yeah. Um, and then yeah. when I did the poll, I was like, all right, this is going to be impossible. So I just went by decade, 80s. I mean, he did some stuff in the 70s, I think. But even in the 80s, he was mainly playing bit roles. I think less mm-hmm. than zero, he was more of a, a media role for him. But we did 80s, 90s, noughts, the 2010s, 2020s. We did a poll for each decade, then an overall poll for the the four winners, leaving out the 80s because I got the least amount of votes. And yeah. then um, this one, I really didn't think it would win. I thought one of the Avengers movies or, um, you know, maybe even Iron Man or um, yeah. Oppenheimer or something like that. But uh, very surprised and happy when this one. Um, yeah. But part of spotlighting his career is also talking about his personal life. And he's been through a lot of stuff. And much like how he got lucky with this character, where the cancel culture didn't really start until well after this movie came out, where he got lucky, this is just being canceled for stuff he did on screen. Stuff he did off screen in his personal life would get you easily canceled today. Because speaking of Marvel, you have someone like um, the actor who played Kang, um Jonathan Majors oh, yes. who's basically been canceled for doing less than RDJ did um <laughs> you know with a lot of the wild stuff he got into with his yeah. drugs because um again it happened at a time uh where you know you weren't going to be canceled for stuff like this you were just being reckless with your career people weren't necessarily like actively trying to like stop you from getting roles because you know it, culturally they think it's unacceptable and also yeah. he got lucky because there wasn't any single person that came forward you know because i think that's part of cancer culture too is like individuals like personalizing it you know it's like well he if he he hurt me in this way he hurt my career he offended me in this way and you're no yeah. longer statistic Now there's some personal story to go along with it. So I think he got lucky with that as well. Yeah, yeah, it could be right. Well, he started as a child. You know, his father, Robert Downey Sr., was an actor and a filmmaker, and uh, he cast his son in some of his movies way back when. Um, But the most amazing thing, though, is that apparently... Uh, as a as a child, Downey was surrounded by drugs because his father was a drug addict, and and he allowed da- uh, Downey to use marijuana when he was six years old. 
so he's he's already starting on drugs as a child and he said that it actually became an emotional bond between him and his father you know it was something they could do together and uh, it was kind of like a way of expressing love for each other um, it's so sad so that's a, it's a messed up <laughs> messed up childhood um so he uh he dropped out of high school and sort of pursued an acting career mainly in the theater um but then he actually got hired by saturday night live you know continuing that theme um but uh he was part of this sort of new young cast that they had in 1985 and uh, apparently they got bad ratings and there was a lot of criticism they weren't considered to be very good so most of them got fired after a year um, and apparently robert downey was singled out as the worst saturday night live cast member in its entire run um so yeah that was uh, not not a highlight for him but um his first lead role was actually with uh, molly ringwald in the pickup artist in 1987 which uh, was a Brat Pack movie, the Brat Pack being all the popular young 1980s actors who appeared together in a lot of coming of age films. Um, and then in, in the same year, he actually played a character who was a drug addict and a rich guy, uh, and that was in Less Than Zero. And um, he got a lot of praise for that. Um, but in a way he was, he was kind of playing himself in a way, <laughs> like he was playing his own, his own drug addictions and his, his experience with that. So it was kind of perfect for him in a way. Um, he actually got nominated for an Academy Award in 1992 for best actor for starring as Charlie Chaplin in the movie Chaplin. Uh, but he wound up losing to Al Pacino for Scent of a Woman. Speaking of Al Pacino, Al Pacino. here he is talking the to actual. him. <laughs> we can come back to that in a second. This is a this yeah. is good stuff here. Yeah. What what timing? We couldn't time that any better. Oh, perfect. Yes. hilarious yeah <laughs> just quoted i think he said i think he said that in the commentary he just wanted to think what's the stupidest thing like someone in his position would say to make themselves sound smart you know or like think they're saying something profound and he was like quoting like a tv show or a jingle or something like that yeah yeah that's brilliant <laughs> But yeah, we also saw Jack Black in there doing some drug related stuff. Yes. And I could, I mean, I didn't really notice it prior to listening to the audio um, commentary, but seeing this now after listening to audio commentary, his portrayal of a drug addict isn't very good. It no. really comes off as someone who just tried to Google some videos, couldn't find anything and winged it. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's not exactly an authentic heroin withdrawal, you know. No, no. And he had a, he had an expert on drug addiction right there who could have advised him. Robert yeah. Downey Jr. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I guess the problem is Robert Downey Jr. is in character and he doesn't break character. So he's not playing a drug addict. So he wouldn't really have that information for him. Mm. You're in some 
multi levels of <laughs> <laughs> breaking the fourth wall and <laughs> I don't know. But yes. uh but yeah, you're right. He had he had someone there that could have helped him, but yeah. But yeah, I just that that freak out that we just saw like a few minutes ago. It's not very authentic in any kind of a way at all. No. So. No. It's just like, yeah. hey, I'm a fat guy acting crazy. Ooh, yeah. you know. It's just more of like a huge his usual shtick. Yeah. Well, I must admit that uh I think Jack Black's character is one of the kind of least characters in here in terms of I barely even remember that he's in here. I don't really pay much attention to him. He doesn't really stick out as one of the more interesting parts of this film. Not at all. He started off strong, though. He that did. trailer was hilarious. Yeah, and was. I thought the red carpet stuff was good, too, because it reminded me of Chris Farley. So yeah. that spoof trailer, the red carpet stuff. But after that, you're right. Like He's kind of just like faded into the background. Yeah. Yeah. Same thing with the uh, Al Pacino. Like, yeah, that booty juice stuff was hilarious, man. It but was. now he's just kind of regulated, regular, regular, <laughs> relegated. Relegated, yes. Relegated. I'm, I'm saying yeah. regulated. He's kind of <laughs> reg. I'm doing it again. <laughs> he's. <laughs> thought you were trying to say he was regulating Robert Downey Jr.'s character. No, no. But no. He's <laughs> relegated to just calling out Robert Downey Jr. Right. As opposed right. to just being a character on his own, you know? Yeah. It's true. Like, they don't really do that much with him. He's supposed to be a rapper who's trying to make it as a, an actor, I guess, which is, you know, certainly a lot of guys... Who, who did that a lot of rappers who became movie stars so there must be a lot of fodder there for the people who know yeah but, but then again i guess the people who wrote this wouldn't really know much about that anyway it could have been it could have been a situation like with um blazing saddles where yeah. um you know they brought in a black comedian writer with richard pryor even though he didn't yes. end up doing what they brought him in to do, <laughs> they maybe could have used maybe some more diversity in the writing room yeah. to maybe flesh out that character some. And you know, yeah. hey, they made it today. They they wouldn't just be canceled for what's on screen. They'd be canceled for not having a more diverse writing group. So, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Representation, they call it. Yes. Oh, yes. So uh, one of the one of the types of '80s Vietnam movies that uh, I think they're spoofing here. Uh, we kind of mentioned it with uh, Missing Rambo? in Action. Oh well, yeah, yeah. Well, Ra Rambo too, or yeah, as well. But it's that little, little subgenre about rescuing American POWs who are still trapped in Vietnam. And there was a whole bunch of those movies, including Uncommon Valor. I think there was one called POW The Escape. And uh, I think there were even TV shows that would do episodes about it. It was one of these great myths in the 1980s that there were still American POWs over in Vietnam. And they made a ton of movies about it. So we're definitely making direct reference here. He's, well, uh, Missing in Action is literally <laughs> yes, <laughs> the, it the is, whole yeah. premise. And a whole yeah. they did a whole series of movies with that. And I think Rambo 2, the premise was rescuing some POWs, no? It was, yeah. I know one of those two. Rambo's movies yeah. were. Yeah, totally. And he has the Rambo bandana on, too. Oh, yes. Yeah. And apparently, apparently, this is actually a reference to real life. There was a, some sort of a gang that was led by two children. I don't know all the details, but they're making direct direct reference to that here, which is more of a real life thing than a movie thing. This is where we get back into <laughs> to the simple Jack plot line, which seems to be the thing that caused the most controversy for this movie. This is the again the 
I mentioned this before, but this is the aspect of the film that's really not working for me, is yeah. how stupid these characters are. Yes. Uh, I didn't realize yeah. how much it bothered me until this watch. Mm -hmm. The movie, I still find the movie hilarious. It's still very funny. Yeah. But it, yeah. I just can't really get into it. Like, they're still going with this premise that they, to, they could have... This movie could still be funny and everything could still work and they could just be aware sooner that yeah. this isn't a movie anymore. And I don't think yeah. it would lose that much. No, no, I agree. And in some ways, you know, you could call it almost a one joke movie, which is that everybody's got to be dumb enough <laughs> to believe all these outrageous things. Yeah. But, um, but, you know, I wouldn't go quite that far. I, I think there's a lot of good stuff in it. It's very entertaining, but that is the part that I have the most trouble with as well. The characters really have to be dumb. Yeah, dumb to a point where it's just like, uh, like you're in on the joke. Yeah, yeah. Look at these idiots. It's like, all right, nobody's that stupid. My my suspension of disbelief can only go so far, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's sort of part of that thing of anything for a laugh, you know, like let's push the scene as far as we can. This character's so stupid that he's going so far here. Nobody would ever do this in real life. Nobody would ever still believe that he's in a movie, but they, they're going for that laugh and they're not afraid to sacrifice realism for it. This part is funny though. When you're getting into the agent, the yes. Hollywood exec stuff. Yes. yes. And again, I think, I think uh, Tom Cruise is one of the highlights of this movie. <laughs> <laughs> His reaction helps sells it too. <laughs> oh yeah, totally. <laughs> I like if his sausage fingers too. They're so fat. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you gotta love that. They don't they don't even know how to react. You know, this is like this is unheard of. <laughs> this is why I think Matthew McConaughey, you know, I, I think they were lucky they stumbled on him because Yeah. He his reactions are so genuine where you need oh, some yeah. genuine reaction. You can't have everyone be a comedian. You have to have some people that like come off like, yeah. what the fuck is going on? Like they're almost <laughs> exactly. like the audience in a way, you know, everyone exactly, can't just be yeah. dumb and stupid. So we have to be like, yeah. what the hell? Like, yeah. you know, it's like they always talk about the straight man and the funny man, you know, you need the straight man so that the funny man can be funny. Um, but apparently some people actually felt that uh, Tom Cruise as Les Grossman, that he was uh, actually, he was kind of a, an anti-Semitic character. They didn't really like that portrayal of an obviously Jewish character. Mm -hmm. So there was a little bit of controversy for that. And I think the this fat suit... can only was, have so much controversy. <laughs> <laughs> well, you would think so, but it's like they were just pushing the boundaries in every direction. So apparently uh, there was a coalition of more than 20 disability advocacy groups, including the Special Olympics, <laughs> that objected to this film's use of the R word, which we haven't been saying, um, and the portrayal of this character and uh so dreamworks actually offered to screen the film for these people to sort of see is it really offensive or not and they were going to screen it for them on august 8th but then they postponed it to the same day that the movie was premiering on august 11th 
So does that sound like they had any intention of doing anything if this group found it? No, it sounded like they wanted the controversy to happen (laughs) on the day the movie was released so that they could get more people talking about the movie. Yeah. Yeah. It's free. It's free press. You know, it's like, oh, wait a minute. Isn't today the day they're supposed to be talking about this controversial movie? Wait, wait, there's a controversial movie coming out today? You know, (laughs) let me go see it. Yeah. Well, and of course, they did find it offensive when they sat through the screening. So they wound up picketing the film's premiere. So maybe that was a good thing. Maybe it helped. Yeah, them. it sounds like great yeah. strategy on the the film yeah. company's part, you know, because that's that's press that's happening as your movie's released, you know? Yeah. It's kind of like, uh, was it Bloody Christmas or Black Christmas or that oh, Christmas Silent, movie? Silent, Silent Night, Night, Deadly Night. Night. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. They showed TV commercials early in the day when children were up <laughs> and children were so traumatized seeing Santa Claus murdering people <laughs> that they had to pull the movie from the theater. So you want to pick up back where you left off with the RDJ story? So yes. he lost the Oscar in 92, you said? Uh, yes, I th- believe it was 92. Um just give me one second. Um, so, yes. So between 96 and 2001, he was actually arrested several times on charges related to drugs. Which Didn't he like cocaine. drive his car into someone's house? <laughs> and I think one time enter a house because he thought it was his. <laughs> that could be. He did a lot of things. There was a lot of crazy things um so he was again the things that people get canceled for today oh yeah jonathan majors he got canceled because i think he said a tweet to his ex that i think was like a problematic tweet like he said like i'll kill myself if you leave me or something yeah and that was enough to like get him it's just like the stupidest insignificant things that will just dis- torpedo a career. And you think about the yeah. shit he did, it's just like, wow. Oh yeah, yeah, totally. He went through several drug treatment programs. Hold up, we got Tom Cruise again. We gotta come back to oh, this. Oh, oh yeah, Tom Cruise, all right. <laughs> oh these kiss asses yeah <laughs> I love the silence. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Tom Cruise is like the sun and like Bill Hader and Matthew yeah. McConaughey are just like <laughs> it's just like orbiting around him. Oh yes. They enhance him though, because he's not funny without Hader like kissing his ass and <laughs> Matthew McConaughey with those priceless reactions. Yeah. You see, I'm making, you know, space analogies as he's making space analogies. <laughs> Simpatico. <laughs> exactly.
apparently this was all his idea doing this dance yeah evidently he was doing the dance without any music initially yeah. yeah i think they were surprised when he just started doing it they should have had a couch here for him to jump on <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? Like, if him just poke fun of the whole thing. Yeah. He could just jump on the couch and started dancing. Yeah. That would have put it completely behind him. It's kind of like oh, the yeah. M&M thing. If I make fun of yeah. me, you can't make fun of me. Because I've already, yeah. already done it. Yeah. That's right. I'm not the biggest Matthew McConaughey fan, but he's good in this. I yeah. loved him in True Detective. Oh, yeah. And then he was good in that first movie that he broke out in Dazed and Confused, I think it was. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm not the biggest fan of his, though, but he's a good actor. Yeah. I never think of, you know, gee, I got to see a Matthew McConaughey film, but he's often good when I do see him in something. He was also in, I think, Killer Joe, oh, which yeah. was a movie directed by um, William Freakin, I think. Yeah, that's right. A guy we covered a oh, lot on the No Room Sumo podcast. Oh, yes, absolutely. Back to Simple Jack here. Oh, God. So, Go back uh, to your RDJ stories. Yes. Yeah, so this Simple Jack story, it's, it's, <laughs> it's cringe. Like it's it supposed is. to be bad in the movie, but it's actually bad outside the movie. And yeah. I don't even care about the cancellation part. It's just not funny. Yeah, exactly. If, you know, I, I would like it to be bad in a way that's good. You know, bad in a way that's funny, amusing. Yeah, it's just this bad. Is bad, bad. It's just, it's just bad. Yeah. Um, so Robert Downey Jr. Uh, he went through drug treatment programs, and he explained to a judge. That it's like I have a shotgun in my mouth and I've got my finger on the trigger and I like the taste of the gunmetal. And he also said that he'd been addicted to drugs since the age of eight. So he spent six months in jail in 1997 and then a couple of years later, almost a year in the California Substance Abuse Treatment Facility in state prison. And then when he was out, he... Uh, he joined the cast of the hit TV series, Ally McBeal, in the year 2000. Mm. And he was actually nominated for Primetime Emmy Award, and he won a Golden Globe Award as Best Supporting Actor. But in spite of all that, he said that it was uh, that performance, he said, was overrated, and it was the lowest point in terms of addiction. He didn't even, he says, I didn't give a fuck if I ever acted again. And so before the end of his first season, he was actually arrested again while he was under the influence and uh, he was in possession of cocaine and val Valium. And uh, even though he was facing a prison sentence that could be as much as four years and eight months, he signed on to appear on more episodes of Ally McBeal. But after even more arrests, the Ally McBeal executives just kind of rewrote the show and fired him. Um, even though he had boosted the ratings. So he kind of lost that role and he lost another high profile role in a movie. And Mel Gibson was apparently going to produce Hamlet on stage and wanted Robert Downey Jr. to be in it, but that got canceled. And uh, also Woody Allen apparently wanted to cast him in a film, but uh, they just couldn't get bonding companies to insure him. Nobody would insure Downey at that point. You know, it's crazy. Back then, Woody Allen wanted him in a movie, but yeah. RDJ was too toxic. Now, <laughs> yeah. RDJ can make a movie, but Woody Allen is too toxic. Yeah, it's kind of a reversal. <laughs> and nothing they've done has changed. No. Nothing Woody Allen done since then to now. No. Has changed from what he did then. 
And no. of course, well, RDJ has stopped with the drugs, but it's yeah. kind of funny. Yeah. So after his last arrest in 2001, he just realized that he couldn't keep doing this. And uh, he apparently told Oprah Winfrey in a, an interview that, uh, you know, it's not that difficult to overcome these seemingly ghastly problems. What's hard is to decide to do it. So I guess he made the decision. And uh, it was Mel Gibson who actually got him into a movie, uh, 2003, The Singing Detective, because Mel Gibson paid the insurance bond. So after that, he was able to be cast in a few leading and supporting roles. He did a lot of uh, acclaimed work in uh, sort of semi-independent films. Uh, but even with all that success, he'd never really been in a big blockbuster film until 2008. And uh, the movie that first changed that was, of course, Iron Man. And uh, Ben Stiller actually wrote a little thing about it. He said, yes, Downey is Iron Man, but he is really actor man. In the realm where box office is irrelevant and talent is king, the realm that actually means something, he has always ruled. And finally, this summer, he gets to have his cake and let us eat him up all the way to the multiplex where his mastery is in full effect. So huge, huge success. Iron Man grossed over $585 million worldwide. And Downey immediately signed on for multiple sequels, but not before he made Tropic Thunder, mm. which was another stunning worldwide success for him in 2008. So Iron Man and Tropic Thunder, the two films that brought him into that, you know, after after years of ups and downs, he had finally arrived as one of the most critically acclaimed and one of the top grossing actors in the world. And An ironic says, thing about the Iron Man role yeah. is Tom Cruise was rumored for it before oh, Downey got really? it. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Interesting. When it was in devel de developmental, it was yeah. attached to Tom Cruise. Wow. But when it came to fruition, it became RDJ's part. Wow. That's amazing. And there was I even talk for Tom Cruise to play in the um, multiverse, an alternate version of Iron Man. Because oh, in the yeah. comics, there's a an ultimate version of Iron Man that's kind of like a bad guy. And they thought it'd be great for Cruz to play a cameo. Supposedly couldn't do it because he was filming something else, but maybe never got offered it. Depending on what, what source you you listen to. I don't really follow our entertainment news that much, so I don't know how reliable either source is, but I've yeah. heard it both ways. Okay. Interesting. So Downey says he's been drug-free since July 2003. So over 20 years now mm -hmm. so good for him good for him yeah and this was a huge year man there's this and an iron man and and of course iron man spawned all those sequels oh, plus the avengers yeah. movies and yeah. the following year i think he did sherlock holmes it was a yes, return to him yes. as being a leading man and a box office draw even when he was the leading yeah. man the few times exactly. he was when he was yeah. a part of an ensemble, he wasn't necessarily a box office draw. No. And um, I think, uh, yeah, these movies definitely did it for him. Oh, yeah. So this uh, this was a big year, an important year for him. Oh, there's gay talk. Did they offend gay people too? <laughs> well, that's a good question. I did not come across anything suggesting that. Uh-oh. Um... <laughs> he, just, he just offered <laughs> <laughs> he offered to suck his dick yeah that's what cat williams was saying oh yeah <laughs> that's what these industry guys do <laughs> i will say this it's a beautifully shot film we only it talked is. about the humor and the plot but the film yeah. looks beautiful cinematography is great yeah made in hawaii on the island of Kauai. um Beautiful place. So 
according to Jack Black, it was actually, uh, he thought it was going to be wonderful because it was Hawaii, but it was actually pretty hard going, having to walk around, I guess, in and out of different places. It was kind of rough terrain. See, there we have them coming up out of the water, which uh, I feel is uh, a direct Apocalypse reference now. to. Well, Apocalypse Now also um, missing in action. Chuck Norris comes up out of the water. So speaking of box office, uh, this movie was a big, big success, but it didn't make as much money as Iron Man. Um, it was budgeted at $92 million, and it actually earned about $36 million in the first five days. And it was uh, the first place movie in the opening weekend. It earned about $25 million. Uh, and it actually beat Star Wars, The Clone Wars, which debuted on the same weekend. And it turned out to be the fifth highest grossing domestic R-rated film. debuted at the same day that Star Wars debuted, and this made more than Star Wars? Yeah, Star Wars, The Clone Wars. Yeah, this movie outdid it. And, um, well, and it that, was... Was it the opening weekend for Star Wars 2 or no? Yeah, yeah, it was. It was that the doesn't opening sound weekend. right. <laughs> this made more than Star Wars on, on Star Wars debut weekend? Yeah, Star Wars: The Clone Wars. Yeah. Um, you talking about like a was, cartoon or like a Star Wars actual a live action movie? I'm pretty sure it's a live action movie. That doesn't sound I right. I think your facts have to be wrong. <laughs> Star Wars. This made more than Star Wars. Apparently, yeah. No. And uh, it must have been like maybe the fifth or sixth week for Star Wars. No, not according to this, but. Um, we can investigate that. Um, but it was apparently the fifth highest grossing R-rated film of 2008. And it was also Ben Stiller's most successful film as a director. And it wound up grossing $110 million in the U.S. and Canada and about $85 million around the world. So a total of $195 million and change worldwide. So big big hit still nowhere near what iron man did i think you got to be wrong about that i would you have can you google that star wars thing i think we're okay. we're, we're pushing out misinformation i don't <laughs> think that sounds right i will look it up yeah just hit a box office mojo real quick that mm -hmm. i mean that's star wars i forgot i forgot nick um i forgot he was these two were in this movie Nick Nolte was like, he left early. Yes, that's right. So Star Wars, The Clone Wars, only made $14 million on its domestic opening. And, There's no way Star uh, Wars only made fourteen. million. There's no way. This is Star Wars The Clone Wars. So perhaps not one of the better Star Wars films. Maybe it's an animated film. Uh... There's no way Star Wars only made 14 million. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, that can't be right. Well, that's what it says here. Star um... Wars The Clone Wars made 14 million on its debut weekend? Yeah. It looks like worldwide it made $68 million. According to Box Office Mojo. That's a cartoon, dude. No? Is it? No, I don't know. I don't think it is. Yeah. Star Wars The Clone Wars? It's a cartoon. Star Wars. No, it is. You're right. It is a cartoon. Yeah, there's no way this made more than a Star Wars movie. <laughs> Star Wars only well, made 14 million. It, Come on, man. It, it, it is a Star Wars movie. 
it's just but it's an, an animated, animated movie. movie. Yeah. Well, animated it's a huge movies difference, could... man. <laughs> Come on, man. You're making us sound like oh. idiots. Well, no, I just said it made more money than Star Wars: The Clone Wars, which it did. You said it, you said it made more money than a Star Wars movie, man. That's <laughs> that's misleading. Well, it is a Star Wars movie. <laughs> so the critical response was pretty positive it gets 82 percent on rotten tomatoes although only 71 percent from the audience interestingly so the critics may have liked it more than the audience maybe the maybe people were offended maybe they maybe. spammed it the people that were offended maybe they spammed the reviews or something yeah maybe there's a lot of people that could potentially be offended in this oh yeah there aren't a lot of women in this movie no, there really aren't. Are there any women with like speaking roles in this movie? I just kind of noticed that like. Yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. Hmm. There were women in the booty sweat commercial. Booty juice? Booty juice, yeah. Now he's doing apocalypse now. Marlon Brando. Yes. Yes. Any other facts about this movie? Well, I was going to say that uh, some of the critics, uh, the positive critics, they said things like gleefully un -PC. Tropic is still one of the most hilarious Hollywood comedies of the 21st century. Another critic said Tropic Thunder certainly has flaws, but at the end of the day, it is an over-the-top satire that shows everything that's wrong with Hollywood. Mm. Uh, but I'm saying, aside from reviews, is there anything else we need to know about this movie? Anything else we need to know? Um, well, one thing that I was kind of intrigued by was, um, we almost talked about this earlier, but watching this movie, it kind of reminded me of a, an old Rat Pack movie. You know, the Rat Pack was a group of Hollywood entertainers, included people like Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, Sammy Davis Jr., Joey Bishop. They made movies like Ocean's Eleven, Robin and the Seven Hoods. They weren't necessarily the greatest movies, but they were fun. And they mainly seemed to be a vehicle for these powerful Hollywood performers to have a good time together. And because they did, the audience did. You know, they were fun movies. The Tropic Thunder kind of reminds me of this with its star-studded cast, and they all seem to be having a that good time. That is a stretch, dude. This is nothing like a <laughs> Rat Pack movie. You are reaching, man. Well, reaching. but hold on. Hold on. Much to my surprise, I didn't even know about this, but Ben Stiller and Black Jack Black are actually part of a group that has been dubbed the Frat Pack. So the Frat Pack is a nickname that's been given to a lot of American comedy actors who've appeared together in the highest grossing comedy films since the mid-90s. And it includes Ben Stiller, Owen Wilson, Luke Wilson, Will Ferrell, Steve Carroll, Jack Black, and Vince Vaughn. So much to my surprise, this movie kind of has a connection 
they're they're, they're like the new you're on your own, you're, you can die in your own hill there man <laughs> <laughs> and not... interestingly owen wilson was supposed to be in this movie he's also a member of the frat pack and apparently um apparently jack black tried to get robert downey jr to join the frat pack so anyway i just found that interesting i didn't even know the frat pack existed i didn't know and now that i know i don't care <laughs> they are not the rat pack <laughs> no they're not but of course i mentioned earlier the brat pack which was the 80s actors who were kind of named after the Rat Pack. And Robert Downey Jr. was kind of like an unofficial member I don't of think the Rat so. Pack. I never really he heard was, him really connected with that group. Well, he was in two or three movies with them. And um, he's not an official core member, but he sometimes gets named. Um and interestingly, uh, Ben Stiller actually appeared in a Brat Pack film, Fresh Horses, 1988, with Molly Ringwald. I think we're getting on like the <laughs> the more obscure end of the of the um, the facts. I think we're well, good with facts if that's what we're getting into at this point. Well, we 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 want to we want to have facts that not everybody knows. Not yeah, everybody thinks certain facts that. nobody wants to know either. I don't <laughs> think these are like vital facts <laughs> that, that we need to like share with the world. Well, maybe we should invite people to comment below as to whether they enjoyed hearing about the frat pack and their connection to the previous. I'll speak for them. No. <laughs> <laughs> I heard this was like a real flamethrower. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Supposedly. He said the line. He said it. He said, get to the chopper. Nice. Here, I think they were saying they were trying to add some meaning to the movie. Yeah. Because, like, the movie is just like a bunch of just like random, like, stuff going on. And, yeah. you know, like, every you want to have like a heart to your movie, like a point to it. Yeah. And they try to make it about like identity and stuff like that. Yeah. Which really seems like a stretch, but. It does. They tried, I guess. Yeah. Well, the uh, the small percentage of critics who were negative on it said things like, the bulk of this movie, alas, comes down to weak sketches held together by ridiculous action, fast explosions, and more or less everything else it should be parody. Yeah, that's kind of, I mean, I, I like the movie. Yeah. But that is what it is, though. It is. And then another critic says, because of the lack of a strong theme or point of view, unwittingly, perhaps, the film becomes a version of the phenomenon it set out to parody, an action film, even a semi-patriotic action film. So there seems to be a bit of a theme that the negative critics feel that it, it kind of becomes what it's trying to parody. It doesn't quite succeed i agree with that I, agree. I mean this yeah. i mean again this sequence is their attempt to add meaning to the movie and i don't yeah. think this sequence really works that well to add meaning to the movie no it's not particularly entertaining and it's it doesn't really like there was no crescendo here the movie yeah. didn't build up to this sequence you know yeah for sure and i, I yeah i feel like it's it's a movie that doesn't really have a lot of deep themes. And that's why I hesitate to use the word satire because I don't feel it quite goes deep enough to be satire. It's, it's more like a parody of the Hollywood characters because they're not really getting in there and showing us what makes these people tick. You know, they're just kind of 
they're going over the top and they're they're going for the they're laughs. Having fun. They're yeah. having fun. And it is a fun movie and and I like it. But I don't think it has a lot of deep meaning. When you when you to me when you go into satire, you go beyond fun. You yes. get a little mean. You know. Yeah. You offend a little bit. This isn't yeah. offending anyone. This isn't mean. I mean, it's offensive um in the fact that <laughs> it's insensitive um you know with the the racial stuff the um maybe to the gay stuff in a little bit um you know the r word but mm-hmm. again it's not like they were trying to be provocative with you know like ooh we're going to push the envelope and like we're going to get those r's and show them like you know, they can't be yeah. taking up our parking spaces, you know, it's not, <laughs> it's not something like that, no. you know. No, no. <laughs> Are we um, going to show those N-words, like, you know, yeah. like, like, you know, they can't be using slavery, like, as an excuse <laughs> to, like, not, you know, they're not really doing it in that kind of a sense, you know. No. It's just like they're going for jokes, and sometimes when you go for broad jokes, you're going to offend people. Yeah, but it's not offensive, and like you said, it's not. It doesn't come off as satire because there's no point to no. the jokes. They're just trying yeah. to be funny. Well, and I mean, if it has a point, it's a really obvious one. You know that people in Hollywood are as they are. You know, they're interested in money. They're not interested in art. Um, you know, it's not a very deep point to make, and we've all heard it before. And the point was kind of made like when the movie started, you know, two hours later, (laughs) there's nothing, there's no growth two hours later. No. No. And I don't get the sense that this movie is going to change anything in Hollywood. I don't think people are going to recognize themselves and go, Ooh, maybe I shouldn't behave like that. Did he go through surgery or something to turn black? Some experimental yes. surgery? Yes, yes. But they... isn't he just basically white now? It looks like it, yeah. I mean, he just wiped off the brown, the black face. Yeah. And he pulled all the other stuff off his face. Mm-hmm. What was the surgery? I don't know. Am I wrong? Didn't they say it was surgery? Oh, yeah, they did. They definitely did. And but I was I'm looking at his face. Uh, I yeah. don't know where the surgery is. Like no, no, you're right. The makeup like, is gone. He's just, you know. It's like that was that was a joke. You know the fact that he had surgery. But was it on Access Hollywood? It was. Yeah, yeah. I'm saying that so, they did that to, to be funny. The suggestion uh, that he had surgery. Again. Oh, you know, you're saying in the actor. world of, in the world of the movie. I'm saying in I'm the saying, world of the movie he had surgery. And yes, in the world yeah. of the movie, this doesn't make sense. No, it doesn't. No. You're saying the actual real filmmakers just yes. did it to be funny. That's what I think, yes. Uh-huh. It's it's an example of a joke that doesn't carry through with reality. And that was actually one of the websites they created to help promote the film was about that uh make pretty skin clinic they called it a fake well, yeah this is company. i guess this is what the the critics are saying like this scene right here where he's running with the explosion behind him yeah this isn't a movie in a movie this is the movie yes. and this is something you'd see in a movie that they claim to be spoofing yes Exactly. So the critics are actually 100% right, you know? Yeah. Because they want to have the big slam bang ending. So they've got I mean, to do that. If this were a satire, he'd be dead. Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah. Because it's saying, like, oh, look at how these movies try to make it out to be. But if this was real, this is what would happen. And he'd be dead right now. That, that would yeah. be satire. Yeah. But and what? Yeah, and it's not even a parody because they're they're not 
they're not spoofing it anymore. He actually is yeah. alive, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So they are kind of taking themselves seriously and doing exactly what the critics are saying. Yeah, for sure. It's the sequence at the beginning of the movie, except instead of spoofing it, it's real. Exactly. So it's literally them <laughs> making fun of this scene at the beginning of the movie. And now the scene is real. So yeah. it's almost like they're doing it on purpose. So maybe yeah. they knew that. I don't know. I don't know what yeah. they're aiming for. It's obviously not a coincidence, though. Yeah. I don't know if we're supposed to find that genuinely uh, moving or if we're just uh, supposed to find that funny. Uh, I don't know. I think when this movie tries to be funny, it's pretty funny. Yeah. Everything else it does kind of fails. Yeah. I mean, that is really what it's about. It's about making us laugh. It's about having a good time. Oh, and here we get the, the final payoff here. For Matthew McConaughey. Again, spoofing the idea that these agents are more concerned with their clients having a TiVo than anything else, you know? Things that really matter. I, I don't what am I supposed to feel about that? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I think it's supposed <laughs> to be funny. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> yeah. It's ridiculous. All right, it's, it's kind of funny, but it's yeah. I don't know what I'm supposed to feel ultimately about that no. scene. Yeah. So he went there. What does that mean? Is she supposed to be jerking him off? Oh, okay. I thought that woman sitting next to John Voigt was pumping her head for a second. <laughs> I missed it. Uh, <laughs> so this is where we're seeing cameos, of course. Lots of cameos here. There are women here, finally. I was noticing on the cast list, the first women listed are Damien's assistant and script supervisor, Vietnam crew. So, not even characters that have names. Uh-oh. Here we go. There's only one way to end this movie. Oh, yeah. Meaningless movie with a meaningless dancing. That's right. Wasn't even part of the original script. It's funny. When I think of this song, I think of Tom Cruise. I don't really think oh, of Ludacris or like whatever rap video he made. Yeah. Well, I think of Tom Cruise and I think of this movie. Makes sense. So Paramount actually marketed an actual energy drink called Booty Sweat. They sold it in college bookstores, on Amazon.com and other places. And you can still buy some of these if you go to eBay for $38 US plus $22 shipping. So for $60, you could drink a can of booty sweat. I thought it was booty juice, booty sweat. That's even funnier. <laughs> yeah, I think booty sweat. I, I, I've called it booty juice, but yeah, I think it's booty sweat. Mm. That makes more sense now. Yeah. Booty sweat. 
<laughs> so what do you think? Would you drink a can of booty sweat? So, I mean, overall, I'd say the movie is hilarious, still very funny. It lacks yes. any real core as far as like a message to truly make it a satire. It lacks a core as far as like a story to really follow. It's just kind of events happening until the it ends. Um, yeah. I don't know. There's just not a lot of substance to it. But it's no. funny. And that's what a comedy's yeah. main objective is. Yeah, it's funny. It's a good time. Can't really complain. But perhaps it would be nice to have a little more of a message. Mm -hmm. yeah. But Ben Stiller apparently has defended Tropic Thunder more than once. And as recently as February 2023, and he says he has no apologies and that he's proud of it and the work everyone did on it. So he's kind of responding to, I guess, the idea of cancel culture and people who are angry about certain things. So well, I mean, he does he, not... he, there are two communities. There's a community that says this movie is no better than the movies it's spoofing, Yeah. Um, which is my, my segment. And there's a segment of people that want to cancel it, which I could give a fuck about cancel culture. So yeah. I don't want to cancel it, but I'm kind of I kind of agree with some of those latter critic reviews that you read that the yeah. movie's just kind of like, you know, it's 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 basically it's it's what it's trying to make fun of. So. Yeah. Yeah, it's not a very deep movie. It's just kind of a good time. I assume everyone that saw this with our commentary probably saw the movie itself anyway. And if yeah. you're still listening and you haven't seen it, it's definitely worth a watch. But yeah. otherwise than that, you know, appreciate anyone who's made it this far. According to our analytics, there aren't many of you. So, <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yes. If you have made it this far, um, in the comment section, put cheesecake only at juniors in brooklyn and that's going to be the secret code for everyone that made it to the end of the video cheesecake nice. only at juniors in brooklyn you put that there we're not going to say anything but you put that there of course we're going to thumbs up and love the comment but it's just going to be a secret society of people who've seen the end of the video and put that in there and you are truly awesome because you made it to the end. Now you're making me hungry. <laughs> <laughs>